In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this program today of Emerging Stories. We have a special edition because it's World Press Freedom Day. Um, my name is Kadir van Loijs. I will be your host for this afternoon. And uh, you can speak to us, you can speak to the viewers. Please log into pakhuisdezweiger.nl. Um, and via chat, you can talk with other viewers, and via a Q&A, you can speak to the uh, other guests as well. Um, since it's World Press Freedom Day, we will start with a video uh, by, uh, made by Bilt en Geluid about World Press Freedom Day. snel door dat die getallen die iedereen zo in de gaten houdt, dat dat ja. totaal niet klopt. Want het is veel meer? Het is veel meer. And one wonders whether this kind of reporting will um, lend a space for prosecution now. Dit raakt alle journalisten in Nederland, dit raakt ook de complete uh, Nederlandse samenleving. Want het gaat om de controle op de dem democratie. En als wij ons werk in kunnen doen met elkaar, ja, dan uh, is het einde zoeken. En dan staat alles onder druk en dan gaat alles klein in Nederland. So let me introduce you to my guests of today. Um, uh, very happy uh, to have uh, Step Faser. Uh, she's a journalist and the Al Jazeera English correspondent in the former Soviet Union. Um, then we have Jantien van Herwijnen. She's the program coordinator safety for Free Press Unlimited. And via Zoom we have uh, uh, Carlos Jamoro from Managua, Nicaragua, who is a Nicaraguan independent investigative journalist. So uh, welcome to you all. Uh, very happy that you're here on a Sunday. But it's World Press Freedom Day. Um, so let me start with uh, Jan Tien. Um, uh, freedom of the press, unfortunately, is still not at the, at the norms where, where it should be. Um, would you have some numbers and statistics how, we, how it's uh, today? Yeah, we see that only um, 14 countries in the world the press freedom is good. And these are mostly countries in Europe and Costa Rica, Jamaica and New Zealand, but also there we see a decline in the press freedom um, because of populist governments, because of um, anti-terrorism laws, because of the economic crisis and also now because of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we also see that... Um, uh, that's the next one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, we see that there are still a lot of journalists are being killed. Um, it is a little bit better because in 2018 we had 80 journalists killed, in 2019 49. But we also see that... Is there a reason for that? Or? Yeah, we see that there are less journalists killed in countries uh, at war. So in Afghanistan, in Syria and Yemen. But it also means that there's a worrying trend that there are more journalists killed in countries at peace. So we see uh, in Mexico, which is a democratic country, that there are 10 journalists uh, killed in 2019. Because how, how is a conflict actually defined, right? Because if you look at, at Mexico or El Salvador or Guatemala, Honduras, it's officially not countries at war. No, exactly. So that's why we say like, okay, countries like Syria, we have um, non-state conflict, for example, or... Uh, 
um, countries that don't really have a democratic government. Mm -hmm. And we also see that there is um, that less international journalists are being killed because um, obviously when you go to an assignment career, you get a safety training, you do a risk assessment, but a lot of local journalists are not doing that. Right. So they're not really well trained. But that's why we see that like in countries um, at peace where journalists are being killed, it's also because they write about, for example, corruption or they're critical at the state. And we see that in Europe even the past couple of years, journalists have been killed. In Malta, there was a car bomb. Um, in Slovakia, a journalist was killed because he was critical at the government. Because your 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 job at Free Press Unlimited is uh, is safety, right? Yes. So c can you tell a little bit what you what, what that actually entails, what you do? Yeah. So I'm responsible for our emergency fund um, called Reporters Respond, and this fund helps journalists in distress. Um, and the aim is to help journalists uh, to get back at, to work as soon as possible and to help them protect themselves. So what we do is, for example, provide medical assistance, uh, psychological support. We replace equipment when it is uh, confiscate, confiscate, confiscated by the police. Um, we provide protection um, for digital protection like VPNs or YubiKeys for journalists that are on the surveil surveillance or um, to protect them by being hacked. And then what we see now is that a lot of journalists um, are in need of protection materials to report on COVID-19. So think of masks, uh, gloves, sanitizers, bodysuits, because it's often also not available. And I think we have some pictures here of uh, Venezuela. Um, we've supported like 50 journalists in Venezuela with those materials because there there's nothing. There are no protection materials, even in the hospitals. You know, the hospitals don't even have enough electricity and water medicines. So we shipped it um, from the US to Venezuela. But that's talking about specifically this time, is it? Yes, but like before that, like the emergency support we do as well. And next to that, we have a legal defense fund. And but you, so you, you oh, have ad uh, adapted your program partly because of the COVID-19 yes. crisis. Yes, but still we get a lot of requ requests from journalists that are in need, not because of the right. crisis. But we, we did adapt it. We have supported 2,000 journalists with protection materials all over the world. Um, we also Like face masks. Uh, yeah. And we also um, have been setting up online psychological sessions, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, they... The partner organization there employed three psychologists and for their members to have sessions with them. And to, to, to supply them with protection materials is also so they can work and they can work safely yeah, on as the front a journalist. Line, exactly. That's the main aim. Yeah, that's the main aim, yeah. Because they have to go to hospitals if they really want to see what is happening there, if they want to report, you know, bring reliable news, they have to talk to people on the street. Yeah. So what 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 drives you in this job if you, if you talk about solidarity and well i think in my past i've seen um i lived in iraq for five years okay and i've been working with photographers and journalists for a long time and i think everything that i'm doing now one of my friends was part of that you know like they've been wounded kidnapped uh, they needed equipment they've been arrested so when i came back here uh, i really wanted to do this just also because of that experience. And what were you doing in Iraq at that time? Um, I was working for, at, at that time, Press Now partner, IMCK, okay. and for a photo agency. Right. Hey, and I understood that, that you there's a special workshop for female journalists as well. Which, we which are developing it now. So we're writing a curriculum because we see that female journalists face next to the threats they're facing, you know, the same threats as the male colleagues. They're also facing different threats which means like uh, sexual harassment, a lot of online harassment, bullying, trolling. So currently we are developing this training, which is really focusing on the uh, physical, the digital and the psychological aspects um, to, for female journalists to mitigate these threats. Because but it, if, if you look at your program, what, what are the effects in, in general on journalism? Mm -hmm. on, on well, of, of, the, of the COVID crisis? On the COVID crisis. Well, what we see, because I also wanted to say we have a legal defense fund. Um, and with that, we support journalists with lawyer costs. We 
uh, do an analysis of an article before it's being published. And um, we've seen, for example, in Venezuela that we helped a couple of journalists that were facing legal charges and we helped them to go into hiding first and to f we found them a lawyer. And yesterday I spoke to our partner organization. He said, hey, they're okay now. One has been released. Uh, the other two are at home. They're still facing charges, but they have a good lawyer now. So you do see impacts of our work. Because, because you know, I mean, I think we will talk to Carlos and, and Step also mm. about this, because obviously countries treat this crisis very differently. I mean, sometimes some countries are in a total lockdown and some, some are not. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how journalists can report on this or do the, how much freedom they have to report on yeah. this. What, what, but that's what, like really uh, different in different countries, you see, because more than 80 countries declared a state of emergency. And some of them also uh, changed the laws to really crack down on journalists. Think of Hungary, President Orban um, uh, issued a, a bill that is it's called like protection against the coronavirus. And um, with this, journalists that supposedly provide misinformation can be arrested and be sentenced for five years. And I think what we also see is that we don't know what will happen after this. So are those states, you know, there's no timeline. Are they still applying those measures after the crisis? Yeah. Hey, um, and, and what's the situation in Iraq? Um, well, it's actually not that bad because I speak to my friends. So there's a curfew uh, in the evening. And it's also difficult to report because access is difficult. But um, there are also nice solutions, actually, because our partner, Kirkuk Now, it's an independent news outlet. I've been working for that as well um, in four languages. And what they have been doing, they are bounding forces with other local media organizations. So they share news, they share information, they verify information because the journalists cannot travel to certain areas. And they don't all have access to, for example, the Ministry of Health or to scientists or the university. So that's why they keep on sharing information. Be because there, there were there were many pro protests against the government as well. Yeah, Bef that's true. Yeah. Did, did but that was before as well. That I was know, a, but, yeah. but did no, they there have ceased? been. Um, well, I think what I've heard from. I my, mean, what I'm trying to say uh, is: is it the is it the COVID crisis? Is it the, also a tool that governments use to definitely. Definitely, and that's what, what, what I told you about in Hungary, but also um, you see it in China, you see it in Turkey. They, yeah. it's but even, same in Iraq? Yeah, it's the same in Iraq, but it's not that bad, I think, hmm. what I've heard now. There have been a couple of journalists have been arrested, but they also, they've also been released. Yeah. Hey, I think World Press uh, or uh, Free Press Unlimited is, uh, is launching a campaign today. Yes. Together for reliable information. There and it is. brought a small clip, right? Yeah. So, shall I just introduce the campaign a little bit? Or? Yeah. Um, because what we want to do is with this campaign is show the work of or like more than 200 partners. Because they are the ones who are doing the work on the front line. And we want people to get the positive stories and to get inspired by the work they're doing. Cool.
I got a, a question for you from the, uh, from uh, one of our viewers, uh, mm -hmm. from Peter. He's uh, asking how COVID is uh, affecting the work of journalists in, in Africa. It's a bit, little bit of a general question. But yeah, well, I think um, we see all over the world, we see arrests, we see intimidation, we see harassment against journalists in Africa and certain countries. Um, we've also been helping journalists that have been arrested because of a tweet. Um, it's also difficult for journalists to uh, to report about s statistics, you know, because governments want journalists to um, give the same statistics as they give. So. Yeah. And uh, one last question from Laura, and, uh, but I don't know if you can say that already mm -hmm. because uh, she's asking what are the results of the, some of the results of the workshops, uh, for the female workshops. Yeah, we didn't start yet, it, so we're developing right. the training. So. Okay, we'll be waiting for that. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Jantien. And, uh, um, we go over to Carlos. Good, uh, I believe it's good morning for you, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much to uh, give a voice to Nicaraguan journalists in World Day Freedom. Yes, because you're, you're currently speaking from Managua, I, be, I believe? Yes, I am in Managua, at home. Uh, right. Because, uh, Carlos, um, you, you were last year, you were in exile for like... Uh, like like 11 months, right? What 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 happened, and and where were you actually? Well, I had to leave the country to protect my safety, uh, and I went to Costa Rica. I spent almost 11 months in exile in Costa Rica. This happened in the context of the escalation of the attacks and persecution against the Nicaraguan independent press by the Daniel Ortega's dictatorship. Uh, it all started, it all exploded during the civic protest in April 2018 against the government. Before that, we lived in a situation of no access to public information, cooptation, harassment. But since the moment the Nicaraguan people took the streets, and start asking for free elections and the resignation of the president, uh, the response was very brutal, was very violent, and the press became also a target of these attacks. So in December 2018, after several months of persecution that included the assassination of journalist Angel Gaona, uh, physical attacks against journalists, uh, the destruction of Radio Darío, my own newsroom, <clears throat> Confidencial and Esta Semana, and also 100% Noticias, were assaulted by the police. They, they robbed all of our equipment, but then they occupied the newsroom in a permanent basis, with no legal order, with no justification, more than trying to shut down uh, a media outlet. So some of our group, some of our journalists have to leave the country, others stay reporting, and we kept our operation open all the time through the internet and social media. Because, because how, can you tell a little bit how you actually report? You're, you're, you're reporting online, right? Yes, I, I, I produce a Sunday night TV program Esta semana, and also a daily show, Esta Noche, tonight. And we are banned from broadcast television and cable television uh, with no legal order, just a, basically a de facto decision by the government. So we are still producing our content through uh, our YouTube channel and, and Facebook. And we also keep our website in Confidencial. So we are trying every day to overcome, to surpass uh, state uh, censorship. And yes, we are successful, but obviously we will need to have a largest audience through television. Be because how is it now for you? Because you, you were able to come back, right? Did, yes, I was able to come back. I, 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 went, I came back to a situation in which we live under a state police. That means that there are no freedom of the press or freedom of expression rights guarantees. 
Basically, we take our own risk every day uh, by reporting, by presenting the news, by questioning authority and the government, by denouncing corruption. Our, our newsroom is still occupied by the police. I work from home. My reporters are working from, from different uh, possible outlets, trying to protect ourselves. And, and this situation has aggravated with coronavirus in the sense that if before the, the outbreak, uh, we have no access to public information, well, now public information, it's much more centralized and, uh, and, and there's no, the, it's, but, but you know, what, what, what changes the equation is the question of credibility. No but, but Carlos, can, can I ask you, because I, I think many people remember uh, Daniel Ortega as this very charismatic uh, leader in the 80s of the Sandinistas who stood up against the U.S. and uh, led the Nicaraguan people to, uh, to, to a different society. What, we are talking about the same Ortega, right? What, what happened? Well, yes. no, he, he, wasn't, he, he never was very charismatic as as you mentioned, but yes, he was a political leader who, who was one of the leaders of the Nicaraguan Revolution. The Nicaraguan Revolution ended in 1990 after losing election, an election, and then the Sandinista Front went through the opposition. Uh, I was a member of the Sandinista Front in the 80s, and, and some of us tried to promote uh, a, a much more, let's say, democratic left alternative, but Ortega kept control of the party, and 16 years later, he, he came back to power as a caudillo, as a strong man, as a traditional, let's say, uh, political leader in Latin America, uh, probably with the objective of staying in power permanently, forever. And, and, he, and he, he conceived an authoritarian regime that, for some period, made an alliance with big capitalists, with some uh, conservative sectors of the church, and, and, and he gave the country some kind of stability for for, for almost ten years, violating the law, uh, I'm, 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 like promoting self-reelection uh, unconstitutionally, and committing uh, electoral fraud. But it was like an institutional dictatorship. Since April 2018, it became a bloody repressive dictatorship. Because I, I also understood that, uh, that that he's he's in the Lord now, right? I mean, he became this. Uh, I don't know. He was an atheist, I guess, before when when uh, when the Sandinistas became into power. But I've seen seeing billboards where Ortega is on a on a cloud and and speaking about the Lord. What? I think, I, think, I think Ortega and his wife, Rosario Murillo, who is the vice president, well, they, they represent a, a personalistic political regime. Uh, whether they believe or not in religion or in God, you know, it, it's, it's just a question of politics and, and manipulation. But, but, but without any doubt, this is a system of cult of personality. You see all the big billboards around Managua, and everything that happens in this country is thanks to the comandante and the compañera. You know, this is some kind of an imitation of North Korea in a tropical version of Central America. <laughs> hey, and, 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 and what's the, the policies of the, of the regime, to, if, if we talk about the COVID-19 crisis? What, what's going on in Nicaragua? It's a policy of denial. Actually, Ortega has been completely absent to power. Uh, in the last 50 days, he have had two uh, TV appearances. He stayed completely absent for 34 days. He never made a, 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 a message to the nation. Nicaragua is probably one of the few countries in the world that has not declared emergency. So the policy, the official policy is denial not promoting any kind of social distance uh, policy. And Ortega said the other day that, well, people die from many other, from many other different 
causes, including car accidents or, or, or different epidemics. So, and, and, the, and this is, so he, he, he's really, he's what, not doing this, anything. What's uh, this picture? The, the, the worst thing is that he is promoting the spread of the virus by calling people for demonstrations and, 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 and different activities in contact. So it sounds to me that, that you, you and your colleagues have a very important role to, to inform the public, or? Well, that's what we try to do every day. Uh, there is... But spe specifically side, about uh, the COVID-19 uh, yes. crisis. Yes. On the other side, there is a social society uh, quarantine movement uh, informing the people let, uh, it, by the leadership of doctors, scientists, and experts, and that includes the church, that includes the business sector, and of course the independent media, trying to inform the people. The problem is that we don't have, have tests. Uh, the government, we, 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 we published an official document by the government in which they said that they allow only to, 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 to do 50 tests, 50 tests per day. Uh, we are completely blind. We don't really know how many people is, has been infected by, by the virus. Uh, the official numbers are that only 14 individuals are positive and four of them have died. Uh, unofficial numbers says that six, six persons have died. So Nicaragua, even under those official numbers which are under dispute has one of the highest rates of lethality in the world. But the, but, the, but the real situation is that we don't really know what is happening. So how do we report? Well, we, we, we talk with the doctors, we talk with the relatives or those who are in the hospitals, and, and, and even within the government, we are, try, we are getting uh, leaks of very important information. The, 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 the censorship system uh, is, is it, it's not, it doesn't work. It doesn't really work because people do not trust the government. Mm. So it, if, if, you, if you go in the streets of Managua, it's business as usual. Restaurants are open, bars are open? Um, I would say 50-50. Mm. Before the Eastern vacation, when the first individual when the government had to recognize that one person had died with coronavirus, well, there was, a, there was some kind of an automatic uh, shutdown by the citizenship. Now things have become much more relaxed because the government reopened, well, they, 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 after the vacations, uh, the kids went back to school, the government went back to work. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of a voluntary quarantine is a voluntary movement to protection and many people cannot stop working because the, the about 70 percent of the nicaraguan economy is an informal economy so that's that's an additional problem the government has not promoted any social protection policy like our neighbors i mean you go to costa rica to el salvador to guatemala the government are establishing uh, moratorium for the payment of taxes, for the payment of services. They're giving special funds to protect people. In Nicaragua, they're doing absolutely nothing. Mm. So, si since you are back, um, are, are you more or less free to work? or? Uh, yes, in the sense that I can keep reporting. Uh, again, not through television, but through YouTube and Facebook and through <laughs> internet. And we have to take our own measures. Uh, you know, there's, there's some kind of a bottom line that the government does not allow. Uh, this is a police state. People are banned in their rights of reunion, the rights to demonstrate, the rights to organize rallies and participate. But they, but they, but they defy the state, the police state. So whenever people go out in the streets, if us reporters go to cover these activities, now we are the target of government attacks and harassment. Uh, so you have to find ways of trying to bypass this kind of uh, direct threats. 
Mm. Um, I have a, a question from uh, from the audience, Carlos, which is from Remy. He's asking, uh, how do you keep motivated as a journalist uh, as a journalist if there's so much fake news in your country regarding this? Well, I think in this crisis, <clears throat> we have uh, perceived that there is really a recognition by the society of the importance of independent journalism, of the importance of freedom of the press, of the credibility of uh, the news versus the official information. And yes, we have taken risk, we have, we, but, but it's very little in comparison to what the Nicaraguan people have done. Uh, there have been more than 300 people that were assassinated during the protest in April uh, 2018. There, were, there was a moment in which there were about 700 political prisoners. There are still at this moment 60 political prisoners. So what we do is just to report. It's trying to, 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 to accompany people with trustable information. Step, you you work in uh, in Russia. How do you look at this? Uh, how it's, do you listen to the story of Carlos? It sounds very familiar uh, because yes, I work in uh, in Moscow in Russia, and uh, what you are explaining about the denial uh, about the crisis, the COVID crisis, has been happening in Russia as well. Uh, I have to say they have woken up now. Uh, it's very serious. Uh, they haven't reached the peak yet. And we had... Uh, it's very serious because the numbers are very serious. 10,000 new cases in the last 24 hours. But uh, in the beginning, in, in February, it, it was much more uh, a denial uh, situation. Also saying uh, this is something that is happening in the West. Uh, it's not happening here in Russia. All kinds of excuses were, were made that it couldn't be happening in Russia as well. And uh, when it started in China in January, uh, Russia immediately closed the border with China and they put a quarantine period for everyone who was traveling inside the country at that time. So they thought, OK, this is uh, the solution. And they thought they would get away with it. So uh, that definitely didn't happen. And now uh, everyone is trying to struggle. Uh, the healthcare system is uh, very poor. There were a lot of uh, cuts in the last couple of years. Hospitals were closed. Doctors have been laid off. So the hospitals are very much struggling. A lot of uh, COVID, uh, 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 how do you call it? Uh, con yeah. Uh, but is, is what Carlos is saying is, is that the gov it seems that there's a policy from the Nicaraguan government. You're basically saying that it sounds very familiar to you what the, what yes, the Russian authorities but are But at, at, at one stage, of course, uh, Putin and the government couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, back this up anymore. Uh, right. And I think Ortega is still trying to, to uh, go for this version. <laughs> which is the, the main difference. I mean, the, the figures were so high in Russia that there was no way you could uh, continue to deny that this was happening. Because, uh, Carlos, that the, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, people speak a lot about that, that this virus might die when it's getting warmer or that, that, that it doesn't uh, appear to, to spread as fast in, in, in hot climates. You're in a, in a tropical country. Um, <laughs> Um, what, what, did you have anything to say about that? Well, there are many, many versions about, about this, but the fact is that even with the low numbers in Nicaragua, <clears throat> we're seeing every day much more people getting to the hospitals in, in a very bad condition. What the scientists and the epidemiologists are projecting is that the next two weeks the first two weeks of May in Nicaragua will be the peak of contagion. And uh, last week, three people died in 24 hours. So these are the signals that things are getting worse. No matter what some people talk about the, the weather or, or people believe what Ortega is telling them. Well, mm -hmm. I, I interviewed yesterday a former Nicaraguan health minister who also was uh, an anti dictatorship fighter during Somoza, Dora Maria Tegas, who said Ortega is lying to his own supporters and he's going to pay a very high political cost. There's going to be a fracture within the dictatorship because their own supporters are also, are also getting sick. Mm. 
It's questionable about the, the weather, the hot weather, because uh, I can see it also in Indonesia. There's a lot of uh, debate about it. If that's one of the reasons, it's not as widespread as what's going to be expected. But in Singapore, for example, where you have a similar tropical climate, there have been a lot of new infections. So there's still a lot of questions about how much this uh, warm weather will affect the virus. Right. Uh Cuban medicine called interferon, which is used for is used for hepatitis and for other for other situations, but not for 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 COVID. Okay, we we missed the first part of your uh, what you were saying. So interferon is used. In interferon is used for uh, uh, hepatitis or for, yeah, uh, right, but. Uh, I don't know why the Nicaraguan government has start telling people that don't worry, we have interferon and uh, everybody will get their doses of interferon. We have interview experts that say, well, interferon might work for other diseases, but not necessarily for COVID. Okay. Hey, Carlos, uh, we almost out of time, but I have one more. There's one more question from uh, from the audience. Uh, which is uh, a question from Lena, who's asking if the coronavirus is actually, how, how this is affecting the protests which were happening. W will these protests come back? Because are, are they still happening? What? Be before the virus, the protests were taking place in, in, a, in a mode of what they call express protest. Very small groups taking the streets, protecting themselves from the police. No possibility of any kind of large demonstration. And the police will come and attack and capture people, and they will keep them for a day or two. Some, some people will, will be retained. Now, after the virus, people are not taking the street. They are protecting themselves. Uh, and there is, again, uh, a growing consciousness among Nicaraguan people that no matter what the government is saying, this is a moment of protection and staying at home. Yeah. Hey, um, one more question from Peter. He's asking uh, if the outside world can do anything for Nicaragua. It is important not to forget, not to leave Nicaragua alone. I, I interviewed yesterday again the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, uh, Joel Hernandez, and he said Nicaragua is going through the fifth phase of repression. Uh, there, there is still a, a big question about, there is a big crisis of human rights in Nicaragua. Now there is also an economic and social crisis, and now there's going to be a health crisis. But the beginning of everything is a question of bio, gross violation of human rights. Right. Carlos, thank you so much. Uh, please uh, stay uh, stay on, and uh, we, because we're going to speak to Step. Welcome, Step. Thank you. Um, Step. Uh, well, we actually know each other from Jakarta, and you were uh, a correspondent in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, for twenty three years. Twenty three years. And then you were deported to Russia. <laughs> then I was deported to Siberia for some reason. No, but that that's, was <laughs> uh, to me sounds like a, like a big change. How it is, is it? It is a big change. And it, uh, I chose to move. Uh, I wasn't deported. But I thought after 23 years, uh, I, I'd done every single story I wanted to do in Indonesia. I interviewed everyone. I, I did everything. I, I made the most of that period uh, in, in Asia. So I wanted a new uh, challenge and then Russia came along, uh, Al Jazeera offered me the job in, in Moscow and I said, why not? I had, uh, have, I had been there only once, I think, before, so I moved uh, quite uh, fresh and quite blank to a completely new uh, continent, basically, because I'm also covering all the former Soviet states. I've been to Uzbekistan already. My first trip was to Chechnya. I've been to Dagestan, Ukraine, uh, Vladivostok, Siberia. I mean, it's an amazing big country. It's unbelievably big. Uh, and there's, of course... How many lot, time zones? I think 11 time zones. I flew from Moscow to Vladivostok uh, overnight, and I was still in the same country. 
so it's it's uh, an amazing challenge, of course, for me, and a, a big difference with what I was used to. Um, and and obviously we speak a lot about Russia. How how is it to work there? Is it, because you're you're the correspondent, the English correspondent for Al Jazeera, yeah. which is a big network, obviously. Yeah. Um, well, it's. Um, it, There's there's two sides of it. I think uh, uh, for me to getting used to a country which is much more closed, a much more closed uh, society than I was used to in Asia. Because you spoke the language. Yeah, the... that also makes a difference. But it's not only that. It's much more difficult in uh, in Russia to get access to uh, high level government uh, officials. Uh, you need to yeah pass a lot of layers before they actually get uh, give you this, this kind of access and i had that kind of access in indonesia which uh, after of course 23 years was much much easier so you still have the feeling that you're sort of uh, scratching the surface but uh, a lot of people were worried when i was moving to moscow uh, what because is this we see you working here right yeah that's i wanted to explain this because um The thing which is different with what I was used to in Asia is the sophistication in Russia, how the state media and also uh, the state manages to um, to portray you as a foreign journalist, mostly as someone who is against Russia. So in this uh, circumstances, I was doing a story about the Katyn massacre, which was which happened in uh, 1940. 22,000 uh, Polish officers were uh, executed by the Stalin regime, and Im initially, uh, Soviet Union denied it. They blamed it on the, the German, the, on the Nazis. Um, but now it's 75 years after the Second World War, and uh, Russia and, and Putin are. Uh, Uh, basically whitewashing this this whole history of the Second World War, making it look much nicer for the Soviet Union than it actually is. So one of, that was one of the stories I was doing. And I was uh, I was filming at the execution center, and then suddenly uh, a crew uh, of uh, state television uh, emerged out of nowhere, started filming us, uh, put us on television, and portraying us as people who are... Uh, yeah, rewriting history or asking questions about uh, Russian history, which is actually a uh, criminal offense. So what I learned in the year that I've been now in Russia is that you have to be very alert that all the other media around you, the state media, and there's a lot of, of them, They can always film you. They can always uh, record something you will say. Because it, it was no coincidence that they no, appeared they, there. No, it was definitely no co coincidence. They organized that. Uh, because in another, in another, so it means that you you are watched constantly, and you have to be careful what you say and uh, what you do, even behind the scenes, right? If you are a crew, a television crew, you go somewhere and you talk uh, with your colleague and say something that even could be recorded and and put on national because I television. Because I saw I saw that you you you've you've worked in the Caucasus as well. I think you were in Chechnya. Even. I was in Chechnya and in Dagestan. So how was that? Uh, it was my first trip, uh, and I went to the the trial of uh, Oyub Titiev, uh, who was a human rights defender, uh, who was on trial, uh, and he was was uh, getting, I think, four years in prison. Um, and that was, uh, of course, a story that had attracted a lot of international attention, because uh, in Chechnya there was before also the murder of one uh, of his colleagues uh, a couple of years earlier, from the human rights organization memorial so and now recently we have seen that a journalist from uh, novia gazeta who was also writing about uh, the COVID uh, approach by uh, chechnyan leader uh, ramzan kadyrov uh, also got uh, death threats and they pulled that article so uh, yeah of course there's a yeah, lot I of think questions amnesty about is campaigning for, for yes her, right? yeah i think amnesty and also human rights watch are campaigning uh, for her Yeah, the, the 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 human rights record, of course, f f in Chechnya is very very uh, debatable. Be because if you if you want to travel there, do you need special permission? No, no, you, you can, can just jump on a plane from Moscow. You can just jump on a plane to Grozny. Yeah, you no. can. Yeah, and I had no problem. I was traveling to the the court, which was outside of Grozny, and and there was no problem. But if you go around doing other stories in Chechnya, I I understand that you have to be uh, yeah. That you will be watched and followed and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Hey, last year uh, there was uh, your welcome probably into Russia. There were huge 
demonstrations as well against the exclusion of uh, some of the candidates for yeah. for the elections for the Moscow for the for the regional elections. Yes, um, local elections. I think we m- maybe have some footage from that as well. How 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 was that for you? How how could you? Well, I I noticed uh, that, and I have a lot of admiration, to be honest, for uh, not only for Russian journalists, because of all the repression, they are still very brave to report, and they are not, uh, you know, they they speak their mind. Uh, and You're saying it's more dangerous for Russian journalists than for you. It's much more dangerous for Russian journalists than for international journalists, definitely. And also the people who go on the streets, they are also very brave because uh, many of them have been arrested, uh, especially young people. Uh, there have been 17-year-old, 18-year-olds, 21-year-olds. Uh, they've been arrested just for being there, for demonstrating, uh, and they have been put in uh, prison for four to five years. Uh, and, you know, they could be extended for a, a period of time. So it is very uh, dangerous to to do that. And a lot of people also were arrested when we were covering these demonstrations. Uh, Just people were walking on the street. I I never experienced a thing like that, to be honest, because we are just walking on the street and suddenly police comes and starts grabbing people left and right and in front of you and they drag them off. And journalists, didn't matter, anyone was just being uh, pushed into the police uh, trucks. Many of them were released uh, the same day, but still, you know, that kind of intimidation definitely uh, works. And uh, people are now a little bit more scared to go onto the street. Hey, but Stefan, uh, you're sitting in Amsterdam now. Yes, I'm far away from <laughs> Moscow right now. I took the last flight uh, at that time, the last flight out of Moscow to be with my uh, with my child, with my son. And And at the moment you cannot... Go. I can't go back because uh, foreigners can't go enter uh, Russia hmm. for an unlimited period of time. But your your team is reporting, right? My team uh, is reporting there, and I'm I'm currently actually reporting on the Dutch uh, COVID response, which also uh, makes me very uh, <laughs> very. No, well, angry. we'll we'll get there. <laughs> let's let's first because the the <laughs> Russia for a long time said that everything was under control that there was no uh, real crisis uh, in Russia with COVID-19. And now, uh, as you were saying before, numbers seem to be spiking. Yeah. And it's it's interesting. You you have to know the background because this was a very important year for President Putin. In, in January, he announced that he changed the constitution or that he wanted to change the constitution, basically uh, making himself president for life. And there was going to be a, a referendum in uh, April. Actually, a, a week ago, the referendum was supposed to That's be taking true. place. Yeah. So people in Russia were voting for him to be uh, in power for the rest of his life. And suddenly, with this whole uh, crisis, of course, this was not going to happen. And the other thing, uh, May 9th is the, the day that uh, Russia celebrates the 75th uh, anniversary of the liberation uh, of the Second World War, which was going to be a huge event. Uh, he actually uh, had invited uh, President Trump and Macron was supposed to come. So it was a very big year for Putin. And this is, has all collapsed because of the COVID crisis. And at the moment, you don't really see or hear much from him. He has delegated his powers to the governors and they are dealing with the crisis. And sometimes he, he goes on to national television and, and says something about it, but he's been very absent and people are wondering, you know, what's going on? Is this a domestic crisis that he doesn't really want to get involved in because it could go wrong and then his popularity could go down? So it's it's interesting to see because he was very much at the forefront in the beginning of the year and dealing with the war in Syria and the Middle East and he was really on a, on a roll, basically. And now he's completely uh, absent. Mm. Because if you, if you look at the number of uh, people who died in, in Russia, it seems to be uh, not so serious. No, but nobody believes those numbers. And uh, I've also done a story about it. Uh, there's one woman, very brave woman, uh, she, uh, Anatalia Vasileva, she's a doctor. She's from the uh, Independent Doctors Union. And she uh, has been investigating all this. And uh, there has been a lot of uh, pneumonia cases in Russia in the last six months. And because, she well, says, what is this? What? this is a story about uh, the healthcare system uh, collapse, basically. In the last couple of years, lots of uh, hospitals has been closed down. And this particular hospital that you see now was demolished, actually, at the beginning of the COVID crisis. And they continue 
to demolish. demolish. Because of well, they were saying uh, we need uh, our healthcare system to be more efficient, uh, more outpatient treatment. So uh, this was one of the the main uh, infectious diseases hospitals in in Russia. And Russia, of course, has dealt with uh, epidemics, uh, pneumonia, and a lot of diseases. Uh, before, so they have a lot of experience, and in the Soviet Union, they were one of the best in the world. But this whole system, like as you can see there, has been uh, demolished. So now they are really struggling. They don't have enough uh, hospital beds. They suddenly, very quickly, started to build a huge hospital outside of Moscow. I've been there, and they were trying to build it like with thousands of people in a couple of weeks. So we don't know how solid that hospital is going to be. So that's a serious problem there. And this is one of the doctors who uh, worked in one of these very good infectious diseases hospitals who was laid off. And she said, if we still uh, you know, could work, then we could have avoided this, this disaster. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think if if we get any news out of Russia, it's it's uh, regarding the COVID crisis. It's it's from Moscow mainly, or from Moscow is the, is the epicenter. What, so, but what's what about uh, I don't know the Far East? There are cases, of course, as well. But you have to know, of course, that it's very uh, thinly populated, not very densely populated outside of Moscow, so, so it, this it doesn't spread as fast. But you can also see, of course, the healthcare facilities are even a lot worse right. over there. So right. we don't have the full full picture at this moment about what's really going on around the country. Because I, I'm not sure. I, I think you mentioned that that this crisis is also used by by the Russian authorities to to further limit yeah, journalists. Yeah, it's interesting because I did a story uh, just a couple of uh, months ago about the face recognition system mm -hmm. and uh, Moscow is very uh, proud of their system. They have installed more than 100,000 cameras all over the city. In the streets. In the streets, but what is different than China because China has also a very elaborate face recognition system. In Moscow, they put the cameras uh, at every house. So every apartment block, at every door, there is a camera. And we've been in the center of the police station where they're watching all these uh, these videos. You can see here, there, there's, there you can see one of those uh, cameras. They're everywhere, basically. So that gives the government a lot of control uh, over people because uh, activists, for example, have been arrested just based on a, on a picture they got from the face recognition camera. So any... Any person can pass a camera and they, the police can figure out who you are, where you live. So this uh, is what the center? This is the, the nerve center, yeah. And we were very lucky. And the, my producer, Oksana, tried very hard and managed to get into this, uh, this police station uh, where we could film inside the, this face recognition uh, center, which was, was, was very interesting to see. So you can actually, I was asking them, can you go and see where my house is? Are you watching me <laughs> right now? <laughs> so... Now, with the COVID uh, pandemic, they have a new uh, system. It's a, everyone who goes outside needs a QR code, which also means that you have to give all your information to the government and then they give you a code and you can travel outside. So they're basically trying to figure out and test all their uh, information and control systems to see you know, how it works and what they can use it for. So this is a very interesting test period for them. So who is she? This is an activist who uh, was arrested based on uh, the, the evidence from this face recognition camera and she has filed a court case against uh, the authorities. She lost, which is not uh, surprising, but she said she's not going to give up. And uh, there's been a demonstration as well of people who were fighting against this system and they said if you put certain colors on your face then the the system can't recognize you oh, really? so they went on to the red square with these colors on their face and they were arrested immediately and this is me going into the the company who has has developed this whole face recognition system and they are actually expanding uh, very rapidly because they're also developing a, a way to read people's emotions. I don't know how that's going to work, but they said if, if someone is angry, they can actually uh, notice that through these cameras and then the police can go there before someone does something wrong. But look at this, I found a way to mislead the system. <laughs> So if you put on a hat and a scarf, and because they claim only the, we, we only need the eyes, but uh, in this case, it didn't work. The door didn't open. So you, there is a way to, to fool the system. <laughs> they didn't like that. Hey, um, you're in the Netherlands now at yeah. the moment. Um, 
Mm, you seem to be quite critical about the Dutch press as well, surprisingly enough. <laughs> Why is that surprising? I don't know. Because they're always good. Because we all think that we, we, we all are think we're the all best. very good. Well, I don't think so, to be honest. But uh, I started watching uh, Dutch news when I was I was sick in Moscow and I thought I had COVID actually, but nobody wanted to test me. So I had time to watch and I was watching all the Dutch uh, reports. And I was very surprised to see how uh, blindly everyone was supporting the government's policy. Uh, because in my opinion, uh, Holland was trying to contain the virus. Like, okay, we have a few cases, we isolate, isolate these cases, make sure that uh, we know who their contacts are, and then we can uh, stop the virus because it's a small country. It only has like 16 million people. But to my surprise, they didn't do that. They just uh, uh, decided to let the virus go into the population. So when Prime Minister Rutte had this press conference talking about herd immunity, I, I, was, I fell mm. from my chair. I was like, really? Is that what you're going to do? Are you letting the virus into the population out of control? You know how many people might die because of that? And then I was so surprised with my uh, fellow colleagues who were on TV shows here in Holland praising the prime minister for being such a great statesman. You mean journalists? Journalists, yeah. yeah. There were certain talk shows like the Wereld Draai Door and uh, News Uur and all these programs. They were all like, wow, Rutte has shown his real you know, uh, leadership. And nobody asked a single question about why are you choosing this strategy? And is this the best strategy? Nobody asked for any explanation. And actually, in the weeks after that, I could feel like there was some kind of collective support, like we have to back our government because we're in a crisis. And I think, as journalists, we have to be extra critical to the government during a crisis. We are named essential. We are an essential profession, right? Officially, journalists. So the reason for that is because we are the ones questioning policies during crisis and you feel it's better now because uh, you know i think suddenly like in the last week or so i can see that suddenly journalists are starting to ask questions like why was this uh, strategy chosen uh, why wasn't there any more tests uh, why was there any no containment strategy because in holland we have now officially nearly 5,000 dead and probably unofficially we there's more than 10 10,000 I mean, you can't just, you know, deny that this is a serious problem. Because, you know, I mean, the, in, for some reason in the Netherlands, there's still this issue about face masks, not yeah, enough I know. tests. Yeah, I know. I wear masks and I'm, I'm being like scolded. Like, are you, who are you that you're wearing a, a face mask? While but, but, in Asia, it's completely normal to do that out of courtesy for other people, right? If you're sick, you wear a face mask. You make but the sure question is a little bit, what well, you know, the the. I think the question should be: Why is this? Why are there not enough face masks in the Netherlands? Are, are the Dutch journalists asking enough questions? No, they're not. But there are some uh, young scientists uh, on But social media who <laughs> are very critical. Is it the scientists are on, in the chair of the journalists? Is, it looks are like they, are it. They I the think those, those scientists are much more critical, and they're actually suggesting that maybe it's official policy of the government not to have any mask because they are still going for this herd immunity strategy. But nobody is admitting it. In How you look official. at this, Carlos? What's a <laughs> step? This is the Netherlands, eh? Yes. Well, it's... Uh, I don't know. There, there's... There, I, I, think, I think we journalists have to... have to be vigilant, have to... Pay, have to play a critical role, have to maintain independence, and have to make governments accountable. Uh, that's the Netherlands. Well, this is Nicaragua. This is Latin America. But, but that's our role. I don't think, I don't think we should give uh, extra credit to governments. We, we, we do have to make them accountable. I totally agree with you. Hmm. Um. I think, Step, we have a question from an uh, audience as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> what's your most remarkable memory in your career in relation to, your, to the topic freedom of the press? Oh, that's a very sad uh, memory because my friend uh, Sander Tunis was murdered in 1999 in East Timor. 
by the Indonesian uh, military. So that was my most, uh, yeah, <laughs> dramatic memory of how freedom of the press was definitely not applied to journalists at that time. No. He was bluntly murdered. Yeah, I also have a sad story. So, um, Sa a sad story oh. like this. So maybe I can come up with something else. No, tell, tell <laughs> no but also the murder of someone I know. So a photographer was murdered. So it's like... Carlos? Well, my own father was assassinated uh, more than 40 years ago. He was a journalist. He was the director of La Prensa. He was assassinated by another dictatorship, the Somoza dictatorship in... Uh, January in 1978. So it's, it's, a, it's a sad memory, but also it's a legacy of commitment. It's a legacy of hope. Mm. So there's still uh, quite a bit work to do, it sounds like, if we talk about the freedom of the press. I think it still goes up and down, and we're not in a very high position right now, I think. Mm. Because a question to both of you, because, um, you know, obviously we speak about Russia, Azerbaijan, Nicaragua, Iran. Uh, the Netherlands, I think, is ranking now number five if it, uh, on the Press Freedom Index. Maybe that will Sh change after this COVID crisis, maybe? I don't know, but... No, no, but, but is that to be proud of, number five? or? Yes, I think so. But we also have to keep in mind that also... But we in dropped, the, no? Uh, we dropped. So, and that's also because of the anti-terrorism laws. So we have to stay really aware of what is happening. What I feel in the Netherlands is that um, the freedom, because I've been away for like 25 years, um, freedom was always a big thing in the Netherlands. And now freedom has become a different thing. And if you are not agreeing with your kind of freedom, then you get a lot of uh, pressure, a lot of intimidation and uh, on, uh, online bullying and that kind of stuff. So in that sense, to me, uh, since I left the Netherlands, that has definitely gone downhill. Yeah. Uh, because I think last month you, you made a remark actually in... You you, you kind of went public in Fila Media, which is, well, it's the magazine of the Dutch uh, Journalist Union. But you, you, you did make a remark about uh, uh, the rightfulness of the Dutch government, of, uh, and, and, but also the press. Did, you, did, you, did people respond to that? Yes, yeah, some people responded to that. But my point, what I was making in Villa Media, was that it's not surprising that a lot of people here and the government here reacted so late because uh, we have been looking inward uh, for the last two decades, much more than looking outward. So Holland has become like a, a center of the universe and everything outside has mm -hmm. become very far away. Because I, I wrote that article because a colleague in China was asking a question like, haven't you read my articles about what's going on in China? Why is the government responding so late? And that was my explanation. And I experienced because that it myself. Because there was a Dutch correspondent in China who was, who was asking actually why yeah, is the Dutch... She, made, she wrote so many stories about what was going on in warning. China. Warning. Yeah. Like a warning. You would think then everyone was paying attention. But she said nobody is paying attention apparently. They think what happens in China doesn't mm. happen in Holland. So that's why I responded. Yeah. And how do you look at the Dutch media landscape? Well, I team? actually agree with you. And I also think that in the beginning it was very flat. It was based on assumptions, also assumptions by the government, you know, the herd um, immunity. immunity. Um, but also I didn't understand why they didn't look outside what you were saying, like why they didn't learn from what was happening in Italy, but also from Asia. Uh, Asia, but also with Ebola before that. You know, there are a lot of scientists that have much more information about uh, this kind of crisis. Because it's, it seems that a lot of people are even not looking at the national news anymore or, or any of the talk shows. It's, is mm. there a difference between television and, uh, and, the, and the written press? I don't know. I Do think you know? social media is the busiest. There's mm. a real debate going on on so social media, but much less. I think in the yeah. official press. Yeah. But it's it's changing now. <laughs> I think so hope. too. It's yeah. better. It's more it's critical. Better They're better, you know. It seems like some kind of awakening. Yeah, suddenly. different views of different scientists as well. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I have a question uh, to, 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 from the audience for the, to, to all of you, actually. Uh, what needs to happen and what is needed to support in 
independent journalism better? Is there... Well, I think governments have to start protecting the journalists. Um, let's start with that. And there's But do you, do you see an improvement? I mean, we, we're celebrating World Press... Mm. Uh, well, World I'm not very positive at the moment. You're not very positive no. about it? No, I'm not so positive either. Not if we have to be depending on governments, I'm afraid. I think our, our media organizations have to you know, be stronger and more uh, determined and uh, really understanding what independent journalism means. I, I am afraid that a lot of media organizations have become in a way complacent and, and too, you know, entertaining. It, everything has mm. to be quick and, and short and, and nice. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult, you know, to tell the real true story and not everyone wants to hear it, but I think it's still important. Because, because you, you work for an international station, Al Jazeera. How do you, know, how do you look at the, at the American press, for example? You know, I mean, if you look at the press briefings of, uh, of Trump... I think there's still a very good journalist there. I'm, 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 I think more critical, very great. or some of them definitely mm. are. But I think Al Jazeera, of course, we have always tried to do something different than most of the the other media because we are looking at the stories from a different angle, and that's something that I really still very much support. I like uh, the way we are looking at independent journalism, and it's also uh, without fear that you have to confront the real story without. You know, being afraid, that's very yeah. important. Carlos, what, what, what needs to happen? Well, in, 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 countries, in, in countries like mine, where there is no state of the law, there is no guarantees of democracy, the only way to defend press freedom is to practice good journalism and to have an empowered citizenship. I think it's crucial to have this marriage between freedom of the press and freedom of expression. We, 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 we went through that in Nicaragua during the year 2018. We have uh, empowered journalists and empowered citizens. And I, and I think that's crucial in order not to, not to accept censorship or self-censorship. Yeah, self-censorship is a very important term because that's definitely what happens a lot. Yeah. Does that happen that's, in the Netherlands? That I think it happen, that's what was happening in the Netherlands, and yeah. I've seen it happening in Indonesia big time. But why? Why would Dutch journalists censor themselves? Because I think it was a, a shock. They're, like suddenly we are in a crisis that they never experienced before, at least not for a very long time in in Holland. So we have to be uh, supportive. Like we have to stick together. That kind of attitude, I think. But is, I think is there, they forgot that they were journalists at some. But is there something wrong how young journalists are being educated? I don't know. I don't know much about the education of young journalists right now. But I hope they are still being educated the way we were, right? Hmm. Mm. But I think we also see another problem because um, a lot of local media organizations are really at the brink of extinction because of the financial situation, because there's a decrease in advertisements. Um, you know, there have been layoffs, pay cuts, uh, freelancers are not getting assignments anymore. So there's a whole other problem that we have to look at. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Freelancers are very much struggling right now. Yeah. And the media is, of course, uh, very much You're relying on one. freelancers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm supposed to be a photographer. That's probably am the I? biggest threat to uh, freedom of the press yeah. at the moment: this economic situation. Right. Um, I would like to thank you all, unless you have a very important uh, remark or question still. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you for. Uh, for attending on a, on a Sunday, thank you uh, to all of you viewers to uh, to uh, be on the program. Um, as I said, this was a special edition. So already next Wednesday, May six, we have uh, um, our next edition of Emerging Stories with again some great guests. Uh, we will have uh, Vladimir van Willigenburg uh, here in the studio who will talk about uh, Syria and what's mm -hmm. happening on the Syrian-Turkish border. Uh, very happy to have uh, Shaidul Alam from, uh, from Bangladesh, uh, photographer, author, writer, 
uh, has been in uh, custody last year for quite a long time for being critical uh, on the government. And we have uh, Gilda Horvat uh, also joining us on Zoom, who is a Roma journalist, and, uh, and she will tell us a little bit what's, gonna ha what's happening with the COVID-19 crisis uh, with the Romas in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, thank you all. Have a very nice uh, rest of the day and uh, hope to see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Bye for thank now. You. <laughs>